you're new in town or just new to this whole podcast thing, you're tuning in to Law by Night, the podcast that discusses all things vampiric with no fear of breaching the masquerade. In this episode, we shall discuss the Ferryman, one of the oldest societies in the underworld. We will also explore their origins, motives, and what sort of cultures these wraiths live. Don't give me that look, silly explorer. The moment you told me you wanted to learn more of the enigmatic ferryman, you know I had to have us meet at the River Watt and have a little punting trip. I was a punter in my youth, you know, in Cambridge. Some six years I was a punter, and I have to say, I sometimes miss those simpler times. No, this is not a gondola, a punt man, a punt. This isn't a pole, but an oar. Now quit your moaning and get in the punt. Ah... Isn't this nice, Explorer? The gentle night breeze, the stroke in your hair, the chit-chat of the river beneath us. It's so peaceful, isn't it? I dare say the same could be said regarding the ferryman who punt the various wraiths across the underworld, and I mean that in both cases. To punt, as I am currently doing along the river Watt, and to punt them with one's foot. Indeed, Explorer. Patient they may be, as they aim to guide the wraith passengers through the paths of a transcendence, but that does not make them totally gentle, peaceful entities. But what and who are the ferrymen? Some say they are messengers of the far shores, or some crusaders of justice. Others deem them nothing more than Chavon's secret police, and thus have a bit of a mixed reputation. Of course, all of these things are true and false, and not as simple as I just presented to you. The Boatman Society, or the Oath Circle of the Oar, commonly called the Ferryman by most wraiths and ghost hunters like us, are one of the oldest and most powerful societies in the underworld. If anything, they are more of a cult these nights than a proper society. We discussed them briefly as part of our lesson on the history of the underworld, so you probably remember that they were founded after Charon was recognised by the Lady of Fate as the foremost agent of transcendence in the underworld, a time long before the first great maelstrom. They, much like Charon were most likely Mycenae of origin or some group of people that would make up the Greek nation. These wraiths swore an oath they would protect those that sought transcendence and policies to deal with those that intended to abuse the quicks, the mortals. The fairy moon treats this goal very seriously, to the point you could say it is sacred to them, as one would expect of a group of individuals whose culture is embedded with ancient Greek culture. As I explained before, the fairy moon served Charon, treating him once as first amongst equals to guide poor souls onto a greater path. You know that some travelled to the far shores to learn to do their job better, individuals that would become the shining ones. The ferryman did not like Charon's position as the ruler of the dead, but knew that a permanent kingdom of the dead, the Dark Kingdom of Iron, is a necessary evil as a means of fighting against spectres and the forces of oblivion. Both they and the shining ones worked together to divide those souls who sought the far shores, and helped them send each one to a destination to better suit their needs and beliefs. The first ferryman had no interest in Charon's then budding empire and were okay with how he chose his senators, who would then become the Death Lords. His declaration of emperor after the first great maelstrom was a step too far for many, for it was the start of the alienation of the ferryman. Charon lost interest in transcendence and would focus on the mutilation of the wraiths to build up the walls of Stygia. They, the ferryman, would revolt. Some threw themselves into the void, others joined the Shining Ones, but most departed and returned to their nomadic lives, where only the most loyal yet lowly ranking ferryman remained. Some fully fledged ferryman remained sympathetic to Charon's cause and had become the core of the Magisterium Veratiatus, Stygia's secret police, who would later play a larger, fundamental role in the breaking of the guilds. The secret police would also discover some many years later the portrayal of the Shining Ones and the ferryman who had allegedly been serving them. There is much evidence to suggest that this was either a ploy of Charon, the ferryman did do this, or they did not. Some suggest the ferrymen have always been slavers, while some suggest they are spectres. As discussed before, they do have their own shadow, one that is cast off during the ritual of severance, a rare and ever-present threat known as the Pacifei, that we have talked about in great detail when we spoke about the Doomslayers, which was an awfully long time ago now, wasn't it? Anyway, 
The fairy moon disappeared for some time after the Shining Ones incident. They would only return during the 20th century at the tail end of the fifth great maelstrom and force the Death Lords to stop the endless slaughter between each other and their legionnaires for their own political gains. To our knowledge, this was the last time the fairy moon would this direct with Stygia as the fairy moon carried on taking those to the far shores, other places in the underworld and seeking transcendence. Now. Lesser ghost hunters would end the discussion here. They may add that the ritual of severance causes the ferryman to look particularly drawn and leathery, much like a withered corpse might. Very fitting for grim reaper figures. Slightly smarter souls may add that their boats are made out of the wood from the trees found on the Isles of Eurydice and reeds from across the river of death. Or their black robes are a mixture of moliated spectre, stygian steel, soul fire and blood fire crystals, or that their can cut through the tempest. Any supernatural obfuscation can scare off spectres or how their scythes are fashioned after Charon's own sikolos and serve as a pole to punt the boat. I, however, am not any of those lesser scholars. I am Dr. Frederick Phoenix, co-founder of the Phoenix Institute, and I have far more information than all those nitwits put together. <clears throat> As mentioned previously, a fairy moon does not have a shadow, at least in the traditional sense. A fairy moon does not have angst and the passive has no fawns and cannot take over the fairy moon through the means of catharsis, but their actions still do feed into the powers of another so they are not as detached from each other as one might like. They are unfortunately inextricably linked as are their fates. Despite this, the fairy moon do not undergo harrowings. It is also impossible for them to become a risen as well. The passive is essentially a blackened doppelganger of the ferryman, by which I mean they are identical to each other in terms of appearance, powers, and capabilities. To that end, ferrymen have access to a variety of special arconi called alloyed arconi, in addition to learning the dark arconi of the spectres. Their corpus is said to be more resilient as in the pathos they draw their arconos powers from. They can affect the quicks from beyond the shroud, but are incapable of crossing over to it. Of course, I can't imagine many wanting to do this. They have more important things to be doing with their time, transcendence and ferrying and whatnot. A fairy moon is more than entitled to deny a wraith's quest to travel for one thing, and you are more than likely to be escorted by a fairy moon for personal reasons rather than official ones. Remember they are apolitical beings. That and the legionnaires and guilds have their own methods of transportation. There are exceptions to every rule as we discussed previously, as we know the fairy moon do pipe in some official stances from time to time. A fairy moon will protect their passengers at all costs, even if it means for their own demise. They are as previously discussed, pretty tough beards to kill. However, that does not make you special to them. When travelling with a pheromon, their word is law. Argue with them and you'll be made to leave, even if you are in the middle of nowhere, surrounded only by the terrifying might of the Tempest. They won't hesitate or care enough to kill you either if you persist, or at the very least, send you through a death harrowing. Becoming an enemy of the Boatman Society is a terrifying thought indeed. By ancient custom, everyone who rides with them must pay them with either an artifact or relic that is far more valuable than any amount of coin or obelus, sticking with the underworld lexicon. And don't try lying, not only can they tell the emotional weight of something, but some are capable of reading your mind. If one lacks such a material possession, they must pay with a boon with a great amount of weight that the ferryman can call upon at any time they please. Some of these things are required for a wraith to become a ferryman. To even be considered, one must have next to none or preferably no fetters, resolving them all, allowing easier travel across the underworld. Castigate is the most important Arconos for them to learn, and they are said to master life web or fatalism. Realistically, this is probably going to be both of them. The wraith in question has to have a good reputation and be a good person with plenty of collections. The ferrymen are incredibly picky about who they take on and are very thorough with their investigations. A statistic we once found is that they take on a new member each decade, and even then that was just a guesstimate. We do know that, however, there are roughly 1,000 that exist as of this conversation. There is no penalty for denying the position, save you not being asked again. But how does one actually become a ferryman? Lucky for you, I have the answers, something that not even Charon himself could claim. <gasps> does this make me better than the Emperor himself? 
Hmm, probably not, but it does give me what the kids would call bragging rights. <laughs> the newest aspirant gives up their name and identity amongst the restless and assumes a new identity, an induction that had more weight to at the beginning of the cult's inception as the ritual of severance came much later, by a whole century I believe. Following this, there are three initiation steps. The presentation of the robes is the first step, where the ferrymen are the probationer rank. The ferrymen-to-be are approached by another Another, they are being considered to join. The probationer is made to do non-important tasks to befit the ferryman, whilst learning about the code and the ways of the underworld. When the time is right as dictated by fate and the blessings of Navigatus, the ferryman in charge of the steering committee within the Boatman Society, the full garb, scythe, lantern and boat are all sent to the probationer who are instinctively aware that they belong to them. If refused, they return to whence they came and are ceremonially destroyed. Next comes the education and the oath, which is where the ferryman becomes a noviate. They are taught the arts of the dead, which are obviously the previous mentioned required Arconos. The teaching of allied Arconos only comes after they have sworn their oath and are taught more lore of the underworld. Before this, excessive use of the castigate Arconos is used to totally silence the shadow, a process that is said to take a whole week. The law of the ferryman, the mourners guild and the deadly nature of the pacifae comes at the third initiation where they become initiates with the ritual of severance which came after the exile of the ferryman and, curiously enough, a trip to the Egyptian dark kingdom and was taught by Anubis, allegedly. The ferryman properly disowns their former lifestyle, name and swears the oath to become a fully fledged member of the boatman society, acknowledging their goodwill brings about some evil. I'll let you think about what this means at your own leisure. To that end, the ritual of severance then commences and the shadow is torn from the ferryman, spawning the voiceless pacifae a few feet away from each other. Assuming they don't kill each other, the ferryman is no longer part of Stygian society. They are fully inducted as a ferryman and no secrets are left from them in Dis, a secret fortified haven of the ferryman. No one knows of its true origins, not even the ferrymen themselves. Some speculate that it was one of the first cities that sunk within the Tempest, whilst others claim it was a necropolis that belonged to the Spectres. If this is the case, this one has been spat out by the Labyrinth. This is supposed to be Greek in design, as thralls, Wraithly slaves and other Wraithly servitors fortified the central Acropolis against the maelstroms from below and dug deeper within the Labyrinth, enhancing the foundation of the city. I wouldn't be surprised if this is great to this day as the ferrymen send enthralled spectres to reclaim buildings and artworks from the Tempest. This is supposed to be protected by a maze of wrecked ships, inhabited by pockets of spectres enslaved with Nudri's embrace to keep curious wraiths and hostile spectres at bay. The maze and its pathways are set to constantly shift and it is nearly impossible to enter this without the consent of the Boatman Society. Should one arrive near the Acropolitan Temple that serves as the gate between the Tempest and Dis, one has to pass a door made of massive soul steel. After that, many tunnels and forgotten halls follow built to inhabit a great deal more ferrymen than are actually around, as most members of the Boatman Society are focused on their mission of travelling around the Tempest to aid the restless to achieve transcendence. Most do not return to Dis, but all know how to return. Many of these storage rooms are filled with various relics and other arcane artefacts that the ferrymen have salvaged in their travels across the underworld. They also have many a forge, where their robes, lanterns and weapons are made. Of course, there are the chambers of initiation in which new ferrymen undergo their oaths and their severance. At the bottom of the city, thick doors of Stygian steel bar the way into the labyrinth. Despite their strength and durability, the doors have been breached thrice by assaults from the hordes below. Oh, but look at me getting carried away once again with this and that. We have plenty of reading materials for you regarding this if you are interested, but I can see you're beginning to see the ferrymen are more than the underworld's most reliable taxi service, and there is more to them than just seeking towards transcendence. They are dangerous simply by virtue of being ferrymen. The Boatsman Society has extremely stringent criteria. Wraiths picked for this honour are already marked by fate and have demonstrated their intelligence and resourcefulness before the 
the Severance. Nothing that happened during their initiations makes them any less powerful, intelligent, or dedicated. They are not part of regular Wraith society. They are guardians of souls whose family are the other Ferrymoon, despite not encountering them much during their work. They are some of the most motivated individuals in the underworld, my dear explorer, as they endlessly fight for their charges life and makes any sacrifice necessary. It is not through any self-imposed heroism or egocentric reasons, they simply do what they must. They are, without a shadow of a doubt, without peer. To be kept updated, follow the Law by Night VTM Twitter and Instagram pages to find out when we will upload each episode. You can also find out by subscribing to the YouTube channel and clicking on the little bell, as you'll be immediately notified when the latest episode is live. Until next time, farewell.